dire wave. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Logos is the icon of the Father, and man is the icon of God. We are the image of God. Dire wave. Three. Three.
What's up? Welcome to tonight's show. It's going to be a deep dive. I think everybody's been enjoying the recent deep dives. We dove deep into the bulbous figure of Orsal Wells the other night and his Future Shock documentary. And that did pretty good. Seemed to get a good amount of views and super chats. So tonight we're going to do more of the same, except we're going to be delving into a piece of Cold War obscurity known as the Rakovsky interrogation and sometimes goes under the dictum of Red Symphony. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into more clips of AI chatbot PSYOP. And we're going to talk about some uh, other things that are coming up, things going on. It's going to be a lot of fun if you revel in the destruction of everything good and holy. It's going to be a lot of fun for you. Just kidding. Uh, it's going to be, we're, we're laughing into the abyss. How's that? If you would hit like and share. And I don't just mean share the video. I would say if you, if you would hit like and share your heart with another person. Like and share. Like other people and share your feelings with other people. Also like and share this video. It's going to be a wild ride, man. Toad's wild ride. Remember that? Was that mind control? Was that Disney mind controlling the kids? I remember getting scared on Toad's wild ride. It was a wild ride. Was that Pepe programming? Toad's wild ride. Remember that? Are there videos of this? Does this still exist? Toad's Wild Ride. Can we look this up? Let's see what we get. Does everybody remember that? As a kid? Some of you... Some of you were never actually kids. You were hatched out of the hatcheries. Right? As a full-grown goblin. And I say that because we're covering Brave New World in depth with, quite frankly, over at Quite Frankly TV. And we just did our members-only chapters one to three deep dive and we got into we did about an hour of analysis a lot of fun seemed to blow a lot of people away because even if you read brave new world in high school a lot of us that had that read it back in the day don't remember it we don't know why it mattered we were just trying to you know get a good grade and cheat well now we realize that we should have read it and paid attention because this is reality so we're doing a deep dive and uh, it was a lot of fun. And that's for subscribers to uh, my website, uh, Frank's website, or to my Rockfin. And we'll be doing next week, chapter four, five, six. And I totally forgot the PEDO element in chapter three. Did you guys remember that? <laughs> Toad's Wild Ride. Not on that. Although I guess I could be. Isn't there some thing that happens at the end? Let's see. Toad's Wild Ride. Yeah, something happens. Something crazy happens. Let's see. Do you ride through a, a wall way, a wall or something like that? Let's see what it is. Let's see. Nothing trippy about Disney World at all. Okay, here we go. This is kind of 2D, kind of weak. So we're in a house. I don't remember a lot of this. I mean, I was like four or five, so that's probably why I don't remember it. This is what, uh, this is Pepe programming, Toad's Wild Rod. So it's pretty trippy. I'll give credit to that. So it's like a black light thing. I didn't know that. This is what an a frog sees on LSD. This is like MK Ultra stuff, right? I 
Is this bringing any flashbacks back to anybody? Does anybody remember this? This is weird. It really is. It kind of is like an acid trip, isn't it? Trippy. Toad's Wild Ride a trip. Yeah, exactly. Oh, this is the part, right? This must be the part where you... Don't you go through a wall or something? I don't know. I just can't remember. Oh, so it's like a descent. It's a catabasis. Descent into Hades, right? The judge sends you to hell. That's weird. And then we see hell creatures. And then we see Gen X people getting off. So the ride is that you go to hell. What? Is there more to it? <laughs> so, so Toad's Wild Ride is just your descent into hell. Okay. All right. Thank you, Disney. Um, if you would hit like and shell, share, shell, hit, we'll hit like and shell because I can't say my alls. That was a skit that I had an idea for a long time ago. And then I got depressed because not really depressed, but Kyle Mooney and Beck did a SNL skit where it was a guy who can't say his R's hitting on women. I always thought that would be a funny idea for a skit. And they did it. The same idea. So sometimes, sometimes funny people have the same idea. It's not always stolen. Is that new? No. To Toad's Wild Ride. <laughs> well, it's been there since I was a kid, man. I went on that ride in 1983 or four. So, but I don't know why it would have been, it certainly wasn't scary as a kid, as an adult, but it terrified me when I was a kid. I don't know why, but so we're going to be getting into the Rakovsky interrogation. And what is this? Well, this figure of Rakovsky is interesting because we're only going to do half of it because it's about 50, 60 pages. And, uh, let's look up for you guys, this character. Because this is one of those documents that we cannot necessarily prove the provenance of. So we don't exactly know how. Let's go to the Marxist website, Marxist.org, and let them tell us about this figure here. So that we don't think that this is just, you know, Wikipedia or something. But he was... The world uh, now very generally concedes to Lenin the great polit political adroitness is not uh, aware of his talent. What other man could have managed under the great stress of the hour to have kept control of the politics of Russia, the Ukraine, the Far Eastern Republics, and even China? And not only does he guide... This is, I guess, Lenin talking about Rakovsky. He guides the destinies of republics. He subordinates the men at, at the head of them. Thus, he is consolidating Russia and Moscow. People believe that Lenin will someday bring the Baltic states back to the Federation. Uh, no, this is Louise Bryant writing about Lenin and his characters. Christian Rakovsky was president of Ukraine. He never uh, reaches any important decision without consulting Lenin. Rakovsky is an interesting personality, a man who... Star is ascending. Interesting. This was written in 1923. He was born in Bulgaria. Uh, best. His family is one of the best known in all the Balkans. The name Rakovsky is woven through Balkan history and revolutionary struggles. He was expelled for revolutionary activities in 1890. He went to Geneva, joined the Russian Social Democratic Party. He was arrested in Geneva for an encounter with an Asian provocateur. He was expelled from Berlin. For participation in the German labor movement. Anyway, so he becomes a rising star. Organizes the Socialist Party of Romania in 1904 1907. Uh, and then he ends up being a committed Trotskyite. And so the interrogation uh, is going to be... Uh, he ends up getting shot by the Trotskyite purges. And so he believes that Trotsky has betrayed the revolution uh, and that he is a pure communist. So we'll see that just like many of the libertarians who point out that pure liber libertarianism has never been 
tried. Oh, that's exactly what the Marxists say. True communism always has been subverted by the bourgeoisie and by big capital. So we don't, we can't prove the Rakovsky interrogation because it is one of these Cold War documents that comes out that is supposedly preserved by a figure by the name of Nupfer, who was a Russian Orthodox immigre. So it's a Russian Orthodox person, supposedly, who immigrated uh, from Russia to the West and then had this translated after he was uh, purged in the Stalinist purge. So let's see what year was 27. He becomes uh, in opposition to Stalin and rallies with the left opposition marginalized. He sent as Soviet ambassador to London. He was uh, involved in negotiating financial settlements. And this is exactly what he claims in his interrogation. So that public record of his financial involvement will back up what we see in his interrogation. And we're reading the interrogation. We're looking at it because it lends a lot of credence, if legitimate. And I'm going to talk about reasons why we have to be, you know, kind of reserved, and not just accept at face value any of these kinds of Cold War leaks and this kind of stuff because of defectors. And we can't always trust necessarily what the defector says when he comes out because the defector has a new master. And the defector has to say what his new masters once said, you see. So we can't always necessarily automatically believe <clears throat> but then again it may also be true because you know it could be the case that this uh this document was not intended to be let loose uh but it did end up getting loose and if it was uh something disinformation wise i can't really i don't really see how it would aid stalin to leak this because it 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 doesn't really, I mean, the only way I could see it aiding him is that, which I guess is a legitimate reason that it could be, uh, that Stalin would support its leak is because the guy Rakovsky says, yeah, we work for, um, powerful elite in the West, especially banking and industrial elite. So that could be a sign that, oh, you know, Stalin basically wanted to purge the Trotskyites because the Trotskyites and the Leninists are the ones that are most cl closely connected to the Western industrial and banking elite, a la Quigley and Sutton, you see. So he sent into exile uh, Rakovsky, and then he submits to Stalin's leadership in 1934. He's reinstated for a brief time, but he's implicated in the trial of the twenty one. And so this interrogation, I believe, is supposed to come out of this period of the trial of the 21, which is the, the case of the anti-Soviet bloc of Rydis and Trotskyites. Three uh, public Moscow trials charging prominent Bolsheviks with espionage and treason. March 1938, the end of the Great Purge. So here we're getting the uh, the purging of a big list of characters. Bukharin, Rykov, Rakovsky, Yagoda, uh, all the people that you know are somewhat well known that Stalin purged out of his cabinets and out of his positions because he felt that they had been. Uh, compromised or were actually undermining his his power this was meant to culminate uh previous trials and now allege that bukharin amongst others committed the following crimes the murder of a bunch of people and maxim gorky and his son unsuccessfully trying to assassinate lenin stalin and sverdlov um, plotting assassinations conspiring to wreck the economy spying for the british the french the japanese and germans making secret agreements with Germany and Japan, promising surrender, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of the defendants uh, claim that the charges were fantastical. And so 
we're going to look at one of those interrogations or, or purportedly one of the interrogations and see what we think about it, namely the figure of Christian Rakovsky. And we'll look at some other things too that um, popped up in the, in the past few days. All right, so <clears throat> if you don't know, there's a schism right between the early uh, revolutionaries, the Bolsheviks, the Trotskyites, the Leninists, right? And then we get the, the era of Stalin, and Stalin comes to power in, what, 1922-ish? Uh, or there's, the, there's this brief period of the Bolsheviks. I think Stalin comes to power in 22, or somewhere in there. And... Um, one of these figures gets arrested <clears throat> and they put him in this interrogation and they drug him. Now it's not drugs like, you know, he's not tripping balls or nothing like this. It's just drugs that would uh, kind of ease him up to speaking, they say. And so there's, there's a doctor that's involved in this interrogation. Dr. Landowski was a Russianized Pole who lived in Russia. His father was a colonel of Russian Imperial Army. Uh, they were, his father was shot by the Bolsheviks. He has a wild life story. Um, the document that follows is a record of their questioning of the former ambassador to France, Rakovsky, during the period of the trials of the Trotskyites in 1938. He was tried together with Bukharin, Rykov, Yagoda, and Karakin. In order to save his own life, he accused Rakovsky. The, the accused Rakovsky made clear that he would supply information that might save his life. And so um, he spills this information to Stalin's NKVD interrogator named uh, Gavril Gavrilovich Kusmin, or Gabriel. So let's begin with the actual interrogation. Now, a couple of the reservations that I have would be that the first thing is that it doesn't read like an actual uh dialogue that human, the people are having it reads like something polished and prose it's very prose and oriented very uh meticulous so it doesn't sound like people talking it sounds like something written which is odd because if this is recorded interrogations then that doesn't that doesn't sound like people talking now maybe it was polished up right something like that as possible as well and the other thing is that it's a little uh little neat in its conspiracy uh element it's i mean it lines up essentially with what we read in sutton and quigley that we've analyzed for many times as well as other writers too like charles hyam and other books that talk about the establishment in the west essentially funding uh fascism, communism, socialism, etc., right? As well as the uh, Johan Ratzio book. So it backs that up, but the account given in this interrogation, it's about, again, 50 or 60 pages. It just comes off a little too neat, I guess. Does that make sense? It's a little too easy. Like, ah, yes, you see, all the events are part of the conspiracy. But that doesn't make it not true it could it could actually be the case right because we're getting one guy's fairly inside insider level analysis and so if he really is that close to i think he says one or two figures above the uh public face of the revolutionaries right he talks about basically being close to a couple uh banking elite is, is the way he the way he speaks of it and he speaks of the those figures as those that own the revolutionaries and being pretty familiar with marxist thought over the years i'm not some sort of marxist expert but as you guys know i did study under a frankfurt school trained guy uh, and I did have many classes that dealt with pretty abstruse level Marxist critical theory stuff. 
And even in, even in those mainline classes, you know, there was a lot of admissions that, you know, yeah, there's been quite a few big capitalists that have supported and aided various forms of Marxism and socialism since their inception. Right. So even in my mainline classes, we were talking about that. And I will say this, that this does read like somebody very familiar with Marxism and dialectics. In other words, if it is in, in some way uh, polished up or fabricated or faked or something like that, it's a very elaborate fake because it's not a low level, low tier production of somebody uh, trying to characterize Marxist dialectics. It's whoever, you know, if it's not Rakovsky, whoever is the voice of Rakovsky here definitely knows the nuances of Marxist neologisms and, and ins and outs and, and dialectics. And so the book begins by saying that, um, yeah, I don't like Stalin because he says Stalin really um, betrayed the true socialism. And by the way, that character Maxim Gorky that's mentioned Maxim Gorky, if I recall, was an uh, anarchist, right? But Maxim Gorky comes up in uh, Sutton because Gorky was another figure who mentions the fact that Bolshevik Revolution was... I want to find the Gorky quote because we read it when we were analyzing the Sutton text, right? He says that it was a, it was fake. Here it is. Yeah. Here's what Sutton says has Gorky saying. And they mention Gorky in the interrogation. Let's see. The reports of these unofficial ambassadors were direct contrast to the help addressed to the West, to the West from inside Russia. Maxim Gorky represented a protest of the betrayal of revolution. Uh, he did this in terms of critiquing the Lenin Trotsky group, which imposed the iron grip of a police state in Russia. We Russians make up uh, a people that have never yet worked in freedom, that has never yet had a chance to develop its powers and its talents. When I think that the revolution gives us a possibility of free work and of a many-sided joy in creating, my heart is filled with great hope. There is how uh, where this begins, the line of my decided irreconcilable separation from the insane actions of the people's commissaries. I consider maximalism in ideas very useful for the boundless Russian soul. The practical maximalism of anarcho-communism and visionaries of the Smolny is ruinous for Russia and, above all, for the Russian working class. The People's Commissaries handle Russia like material from an experiment. The Russian people is for them what the horse is for the learned bacteriologists who inoculate the horse it is a predestined to fail experiment foisted upon the Russian people. And so Maxim Gorky says that it's supported because it is a predestined experiment that will destroy. And Gorky comes up here because Rakovsky says, I know by heart the words from the letter of Lenin to Gorky. War between Austria and Russia would be a most powerful, most useful thing for revolution. It is hardly possible that Franz Joseph and Nicholas, the Tsar, would present us with this opportunity. And so you can see the so-called Trotskyites, the inventor of the defeat of 1905, continue at the present stage and timeline and same line, the line of Lenin. And so he's saying that even within the dialectics of communism is embedded within it certain phases of and certain periods where it's intended to fail. And he argues that uh, Kerensky, uh, I think it's Kerensky, he says, was the real hero of the revolution because it was Kerensky who promised everybody a brief republic, which convinced them to hand things over to the revolutionaries. And then he just immediately, after a few months, handed it over to the Bolsheviks. So he was like actually the great, what they call um, 
intentional failure, he says. He says that was on purpose because they knew that that would be a better route to getting Bolshevism than um, trying to immediately have Bolshevism. The people would more easily succumb to that. And that's actually mentioned in the Fabian uh, book as well, the Ratu book, where he says that Fabianism was more perceptive in that people would accept democracy and uh, that kind of stuff before they would accept straight up, you know, true, true communism. So Rakowski says that uh, I am a true communist. I represent the real true form of communism and you Stalinists have betrayed the revolution. You betrayed what it's supposed to be because he argues Stalin is a uh, bourgeois figure, he says. Interesting. We'll see why he says that here in a minute, but he says that USSR under Stalin is a formal communism, not a real communism. So it's only communist in name and in form, but it's not actually practicing it because of, quote, Stalin. And he says that I am the true uh, believer in the force of Histmat. So when he said, when he mentions Histmat, then I know that this, again, that's people that are actually into communism know about, they would use that terminology, right? Uh, historical materialism, he says, is a sort of necessary force within history. And that's what the historical materialists thought uh, over against the dialectical materialists. So there's different factions of Marxists. And there's the Eastern Bloc Soviet ones, right? And then there's these pure Marxists, the Trotskyite types. And then they get into this uh, weird discussion of the contradictions. This is the most fascinating part within communism. And so they start by talking about Tiny Mustache Man, and Rakowski says, Tiny Mustache Man needed socialism to have a victory over socialism. In his very anti-socialist socialism, he calls it national socialism. Stalin needs socialism in order to defeat socialism as well. The parallel is obvious, but notwithstanding, Tiny Mustache Man socialism and uh, Stalin's uh, anti, uh, communist anti-communism uh, ultimately, transcendentally, will help to create. He's uh, transcendentally create socialism and communism. They and many others will participate in this. He's saying that they're all participating in the dialectic, even if they don't want to. He says that they will ultimately create the world which we, the communo Marxists, will inherit. That's what H.G. Wells says too. That's interesting because. If H.G. Wells and if Rakowski are actual, uh, very close to the inner party members of the actual power structure of the revolution, as Rakowski claims he is, then that makes sense because that's what they believe. They believe that these forms are all participating in the dialectic to bring us to the true and final goal, which is the final revolution. Now, true communism, he says, is Trotskyism. He says that's the the pure communism that will continue and will envelop the world. And this kind of takes his interrogator, Gabriel, uh, who's a little less sophisticated by surprise because he says, well, how, you're not even in power. How could you be the true communism that will inherit the earth? And he says, well, allow me to explain to you how the world really works. And this is where it begins to get more and more interesting. And he says, how, what do you mean how the world really works? And he says, well, take the figure of Tiny Mustache Man. He says, who do you think he serves? And then Gabriel says, well, he control he's he serves uh, the coitery of international capital. And so we have this NKVD interrogator, you know, basically saying, yeah, that's kind of true, right? We, we've heard this a lot. Quigley basically says that. Quigley has a section, in fact... I recently shared, I would forgotten this part. Is it uh, like 10, page 1049 or something? The Schroeder Bank, I think. Yes. Yes, it is 1059. I was close. Remember this? Should we show this? I think we should. This is a pretty wild section of Tragedy and Hope. And this actually backs up both the analysis of 
Rakowski and his interrogator Gabriel because they both are admitting what Quigley's admitting here. So let's see what Quigley says. And I'll, give, me, give me a document camp. Give me a document camp, folks. All right. Is that too red? Can we read that? So it reads, The British, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, and the World Petroleum Cartel, the American government, and the older Iranian elite led by the Shah can combine to crush Mosaddegh. So you guys can see that. That's what it said. But I'm going to have to move it over here because I can't read it all the way there. The chief effort, this, he's talking about the Iranian revolution, right? That was done by the CIA, which by the way, he's saying that the CIA ran the revolution against Mossadegh in Tragedy and Hope in 1960, what? Six. That wasn't declassified until what? Not that long ago. So again, Quigley, Quigley's not a conspiracy text dummy. Quigley is writing from the vantage point in the archives of the CFR and the elite. And so here, here he's telling you in 1966 what was declassified. I don't know when it was. The 2000s, somewhere in there, that they declassified the Iranian Revolution was the CIA. Um, which was obvious, but still. Um, the chief effort came from the American Super Secret Intelligence Agency, the CIA, under the personal direction, direction, direction of Alan Dulles, the brother of the Secretary of State, the former director of Schroeder Bank in New York, in London since 1902. Wait, excuse me. He was an old associate of Frank's, Frank C. Tiarks, a partner in Schroeder Bank in London since 1902, a director of the Bank of England from 1912 to 1945, as well as Lazar Brothers Bank and the Iranian Oil Company. It will be recalled that Schroeder Bank in Cologne helped to arrange Tiny Mustache Man's accession to power as chancellor in 1933. Exactly. Schroeder Bank... Lazar Banks brought Tiny Mustache Man to power, as we've always said. So, when Rakovsky and Gabriel are talking, Gabriel says, okay, uh, well, yeah, Hitler, Tiny Mustache Man uh, serves Western capital and elite, right? And he says, yeah, you're right. And then he says, but do you imagine that Tiny Mustache Man is the only individual or only power that serves the money power? And of course, Gabriel says, well, yeah, I mean, because we're fighting against that. And he says, do you understand that Tiny Mustache Man must eventually, by dialectical necessity, inevitably, inevitably attack USSR and engage in a struggle on an international plane? and Gabriel thinks that he's saying this because of some sort of uh, force of Marxist dialectics, which he, in part he's saying that, but it's not actually this metaphysical force that's out there in the world. Who do you think the actual force secretly is? Well, it's the Western international finance structure. It says capitalism is fraught with contradictions. And Rakowski says, of course it is. He says, but now are you ready for the big red pill, which is that communism is also fraught with internal contradictions. And he says that you, as an interrogator in NKVD, you know a little bit of Marxism. He says, but you know public Marxism. He says, you know profane level Marxism. I'm serious, that's what he says. And he says, what do you mean? He says, well, I know and I, I'm friends with the actual people that run Marxism the actual international and the creators of the international. He says that this is esoteric Marxism. And he says, Marxism really does operate like an ancient esoteric religion. Fascinating. And he says that what is absolutely essential, he says, it's good that you know these elementary crude notions of Marxism. And that's part of revolution. But, but real Marxism is in a sense, esoteric, he says, but it's not ultimately really that difficult or hard to figure out. He says, the meaning of Marxism actually is constant, perpetual revolution. And he says, it is, it is conspiracy. He says, it's not mainly an economic system. 
is not mainly a system of social justice. It's not mainly a system to uh, change the state. It is a conspiracy of perpetual revolution. And he says that Marxism embraces contradiction because it does not seek some sort of perfect abstract system. He says Marxism doesn't seek a perfect economics because there is no perfect economic system. He says all economic systems, all life is contradictions. And the Marxist embraces contradiction because contradictions are facts of life and facts of reality. And so get this, he calls it as one famous uh, writer. You remember Gary North? Gary North has a book called Marx's Religion of Revolution. Well, actually, Rakowski says the same thing. He says that Marxism is a religion of revolution. And he says the genius of Marx was to recognize that capital wasn't really its enemy. Capital is what will ultimately give victory to communism, its enemy. He says, this is the great truth of revolutionary dialectics. In fact, he says, there could never be capitalism without communism, and there could never be communism without capital. Capitalism, in fact, will give Marxism the victory by design. Why is that? He says, because the biggest powers of capital, particularly finance, as well as in industry too, we know from, from Sutton. It's not just finance, but it's also industry. And industry and finance work closely together, right? We all know that. Because ultimately Marxism is the creation of big capital. And it needs Mar- it needs Marxism to eat itself and the Marxists foster the revolution, which feeds the capitalist and the Marxists, he says, even we intentionally create misery and revolution. He says, that's true. Trotskyite Marxism, classic Marxism. We're not worried about being consistent. Marxism is contradictions. It is intentionally contradictory. And it needs capitalism and is not the enemy of big capital. And he says, Marx was always aware of this and the true Marxist understands this. He says, ultimately, it is a conspiracy of revolution. We intentionally cause tension, a strategy of tension, you could say. In order to, for example, he says, let me give you an example. Uh, an example. He says, sometimes uh, we want there to be more poverty because that will lead to more worker misery, which leads to more revolution. And so one gets a vicious circle. Strikes, more strikes, more hunger, more inflation, more hunger. He says that there's a, there's a response from Gabriel. He says, well, with the exception of the strikes, this all takes place at the expense of the surplus value out of capitalism. Rakowski says, you are speaking theory, pure theory. Between you and I, take any handbook concerning the economics of any country. And if you divide the rents and the total income by those receiving wages and salaries, you will see that an extraordinary result emerges. The result is that the most counter-revolutionary fact, and we must keep this a complete secret, he says, is that the abolition of ownership almost always then remains with a dividend, which is a debit for the proletariat. In other words, the revolution always ends up costing the workers. In reality, a debt, if we consider the reduction in the volume of quantity of production, is a debt that is foisted upon the workers. And so he says the more strikes, the more destruction, the more chaos, it doesn't hurt the capitalist elite. It hurts the workers. <laughs> and he says that, that we're absolutely fine with that because that's the secret to how the revolution continues. More and more misery.
And this is blowing the mind of Gabriel. He's like, I, this doesn't make any sense. I can't understand this. And he says, that's because you don't understand what Marxism is. He says, you think that Marxism is a economic system or a science or this or that. He says, no, it is a uh, conspiracy first and foremost. And it is a religion of revolution. And Gabriel can't fathom that. He says, allow me to explain even further. Why do you think he says Marx concealed all the financial contradictions that I just mentioned, which could not have remained hidden from his penetrating gaze? If finance had, had not finance had not had an ally, the influence of which was revolutionary. In other words, do you think that Marx didn't realize that financiers and Western cap monopoly capitalists are already revolutionary? Don't you realize that? Capitalism is a revolutionary force. Anarcho-capitalism is the cousin out of the enlightenment of the, it's kissing cousin of the socialist, communist, Jacobin revolutionaries. And Gabriel says, well, this might be the case, but this is not intentional. It's an unconscious coincidence. He says, okay, well then we can, we don't have to debate that. He says, let's look at another thing that makes this even clearer. Let's look at finance and what sort of people are at work. The international essence of money is well known. From the fact that the energies that organize, organize them from a cosmopolitan organization. He says, finance is inherently cosmopolitan. Finance in its, in its apogee, in its aim, and particularly the financial international, deny and reject anything national. In fact, they do not recognize the state. Therefore, capital is inherently anarchic and is and would be absolutely anarchical if the denier of any nation state were not itself by the necessity a state by its own essence. The state as such is power. Money is also power. The communist superstate, which we are creating, uh, during this entire century and the scheme of which is the international of Marx, analyze it and you will see its essence. The scheme of the international and its prototype, the USSR, is pure power. The basic similarity between the two creations is absolute, something fatalistic and inevitable, since the personalities and authors of both are identical. The financier is just as international as the communists. Both with the help of differing pretexts and differing means, struggles with the bourgeois state or the national state and denies it. Marxism in order to change it into a communist state, and from this, the Marxist must be an internationalist. The financier denies it, denies the bourgeoisie national state, and its denial ends in itself. In fact, he does not manifest himself as an internationalist, but as a cosmopolitan anarchist. Thus, there is the similarity between the Communist International and Finance International. He says this is because the god of the new societies, he's saying post-revolutionary, post-enlightenment periods, is money. The money god is the new god. And why is the all-seeing eye on the dollar bill? Because it's the money god. He says, interestingly, the uh, money power is more cruel than any of the kings in the past. Interesting. And Rakovsky says, what, well, what do you mean this mythical power? You, you're, you're attributing religious mythology power to, to money. How is that? He says, because they have the privilege of coining the money. And that is exactly what Quigley says in the first 200 pages of Tragedy Hope. And Gabriel says, well, this is a wild paradox. Uh, he's, he's sort of mystified by this. He says, this is risky. It's, it's even poetic. <laughs> Rakovsky says, well, it's brilliant, but it's not a paradox. You may think that. And he says, you may think that states still coin money on pieces of metal and they put a royal bust or a national crest on it. So what? The great part of the money that circulates is money for big affairs and represents national wealth, money, yes, money, 
is being issued by a few people, but it's not the people that you think. The titles, the figures, the checks, the promissory notes, the endorsements, the discount, the quotations, they flood like a waterfall. What are those, What are these in comparison to the metallic and the paper money? And then he goes on to say that in the face of the growing flood of the all flooding financial money, he says, ultimately money goes back to the banks that issued the money and the banks that issue the money are not state banks. He's saying, he says that the money system that's out there in the public use is based on financial monies that are credit money. So it's not actual money. It's fake money. Fiat. He says these are figures, abstractions. They're based on credit, based on faith. Do you not understand? It is fraud. False money. Banks, stock exchanges, the whole world financial system is a giant machine for the purpose of bringing about unnatural scandals, according to Aerosol's expression, to force money to produce money, a.k.a. usury. So it's a giant debt-based usury fiat system. So he's giving him a lecture in the exact same thing that Quigley says in the first 200 pages here. And basically explaining the Federal Reserve System, right? And he says that it's all based on shams and uh, interest and then more and more shams and more and more money printing. And this is where we get inflation. This is and the money's all fake. Uh, and he says, bear in mind, the system I'm describing is one of the most innocent among those used for the fabrication of money. Imagine if you can a small number of people having unlimited power over the possession of real wealth. And you'll see that they are the absolute dicta dictators of the stock exchange. And they will also be the dictators of production and distribution and work and consumption. If you have enough imagination, then you can multiply this by the global factor and you will see that it is anarchical. It's You will see its anarchic moral social influence. It is revolutionary. Do you not understand? In other words, the fiat money system itself is the revolutionary system. Did you hear that? What an amazing admission. Again, maybe this is not an authentic document, but it lines up with what Quigley says. Fascinating. And so he's arguing something that's just, again, blowing the mind of the NKBD interrogator. He's arguing that the money system that exists is not the enemy. It's not the enemy of the Marxist revolutionary. The money system is revolutionary. It is Marxist, he's saying. <laughs> And this is blowing the mind of the interrogator. And he says that you could think of it like a kind of uh, miracle. It's uh, it's money, it's value, wealth created out of nothing by the money printer go brr, brr. And he says, did you read your Trotsky? He says, because Trotsky admits it. Uh, Gabriel says, well, your view is, it seems faulty because finances as defined by Marx and more especially by Engels are determined by capitalist production. Rakowski says, no, it is exactly the opposite. The capitalist production, excuse me, this, the capitalist system of production is determined by finance. It's the other way around. The fact that Engels states the opposite and even tries to prove this is the most obvious proof that finance rules bourgeois production. And so it was even before Marx and Engels that finances are the most powerful instrument in revolution. And the com common turn was nothing but a toy in the hands of finance. However, neither Marx nor Engels will themselves disclose or explain this. In fact, you have to go to Trotsky. And he says, Rakowski says, Gabriel says, well, this isn't new. Didn't uh, Trotsky say this? And Rakowski says, tell me, when did, when did Trotsky say this? And Gabriel says, well, he said that the common turn is a conservative organization in comparison to the New York Stock Exchange. He points out that big banks uh, are the investors of the inventors of the revolution. 
Yes, he says this in a small book, which he foretold in which he foretells the fall of England. And he says, who pushes England along the path of revolution? It is not Moscow. It is New York. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, it's not the KGB that are causing the revolution in England. Did you hear that, Tricats? And then Gabriel says, well, uh, it's still not a conspiracy because the financiers did it unconsciously. <laughs> yeah, sure. The explanation of which, he says, uh, Marx and Engels camouflage the truth, but it is also applicable to Trotsky. And he says that bankers carry out irresistibly and unconsciously a revolutionary mission. No, it's not unconscious. And he makes fun of me. He says, the financiers are unconscious revolutionaries since they are only such objectively. And they are what? They have in the, the incapacity to... to he, says, he says, do you think that the people that run the world are idiots? He says, you actually believe that they're unconscious revolutionaries? He says, how do you think they gain control of much of the world if their intellectual incapacities are such that they cannot understand what they are doing? He says, that they're, they're not dumb. He says, I simply assert that they are revolutionaries, both objectively and subjectively. And Gabriel says, the bankers are revolutionaries? You must be insane. I? No, I'm not insane. You? Maybe a little. He says, they're people like you and me. The difference is that they control money in unlimited amounts. He means money printing. Right, fiat system. And he says that they have the will to power. He says, yeah, but Stalin has will to power. He says, yeah, but Stalin has the will to power in the USSR. These other figures have the will to power worldwide. And he says that if you think about in comparison to previous rulers, he says the money power has surpassed Pharaoh or Caesar in their power. Rakowski says, that's interesting. At least this is some example of insanity. Certainly it is insanity in a lesser degree in the case of Lenin, who dreamt of power over the entire world when he was in his attic, and, or perhaps the insanity of Stalin dreaming of the state uh, over the whole world as he was dwelling in, an, in a Siberian hut. He says, but the dreams of such ambitious people are much, nat much more natural to money people living in giant skyscrapers in New York. So he says, you think that it's insane to dream of running the world? He says, well, you're talking about Lenin dreaming of running the world as he was in an attic in Switzerland and Stalin dreaming of running the world in a cabin in Siberia. He says, but you don't think that guys that have gigantic towering skyscrapers in New York don't dream of running the world? So he's just completely demolishing the kind of naive uh, global understanding that Gabriel has. He says, no, this is a, a, not an elementary thing, but it is, in fact, an intelligent conspiracy. And he says, are they, uh, are you thinking of individuals that work at the World Bank? He says, no, I'm speaking of individuals that you don't know. He says, they don't work at some public institution like uh, the World Bank or a credit union. He says they're the people that created the World Bank. <laughs> and then he goes into more of the history of revolution. He says, let me explain to you from the history of revolution. Do you not understand that revolutions need money? Do you think they just happen when everybody's broke and they can just revolutionize an entire country with no money, no funds? He says, let me explain to you our history. He says, do you remember the early communists in the French revolutionary and pre-revolutionary period. And he says, think of Adam Weishaupt. Weishaupt was a communist. He, he, ar he argued for communism and he left the Jesuit order and had, uh, he says, come under the influence of Gnosticism. Weishaupt was, of course, the founder of the first communist international. And he formed a secret revolution to do it. 
And so he's explaining, he says, do you not understand that it's not any weirder than <clears throat> uh, Vyshop founding a secret institution? He's like, so if, if Adam Vyshop creates a secret society and he's one of our first most famous communists, why do you imagine that it's impossible or odd that today's socialists are part of a similar conspiracy? And I'm trying to remember if he mentions Mark. Marx. And then he says, there's this figure uh, that Disraeli wrote about in his books, which I've never read this. I didn't even know this. He said, do you know Disraeli wrote books? One of them is called Coningsby. And he says, Coningsby uh, wrote into his novels, if you guys remember, much like probably the uh, figure of Colonel Edwin Mandel House in his book, Philip Drew Administrator, where he pictures himself as the handler to President Woodrow Wilson, right? And the same thing we have with uh, Benjamin Disraeli writing a novel about himself and Lord Rothschild together. According to Disraeli's biographer, the character of Sidonia is a cross between Lionel de Rothschild and Disraeli himself. There you go. That's just public literature, right? So Rakovsky is saying, if you're familiar with this book, the book is telling you what I'm talking about, right? He says... The English premier who is his creature has been left to us, say in the novel. He described him in the character of Sidonia, the, the handler, a man who, according to the story, is a multimillionaire and controls spies, Carbonari, who are Italian secret society, Freemasons, gypsies, revolutionaries, and all of this seems fantastical. But it has been proven that Sidonia is an idealized portrait of... Ralph Child. <laughs> Ralph Child. And he says that if you read the book, you'll understand that this is talking about how finance controls and steers revolution. And then he goes on to say that <clears throat> he says war doesn't really benefit the state or the people. He's talking about war in our day, right? He says war is actually revolutionary. War and, and remember to these people revolution, uh, in terms of the the the, the early revolutionaries, the Marxists, the uh, not the Stalinists, but the the Trotskyites and the Leninists, I guess. He says war is itself a revolutionary act because it is anarchic and it contributes to the dialectic. He's saying. He says, war also helps to create anarchy. Let me see what he says. Are you capable of visualizing the fact that such, that this is such a, of such cosmic importance? It is not already, uh, is it not already, is it, is war not already a revolutionary function? Since that time, every war is a giant, he's talking about the 20th century and the 19th and 20th century. Every war has been a giant step towards world communism. And if some mysterious force satisfied the passionate wish of Lenin, which he had expressed to Gorky, remember that, remember 1905 to 1914, admit at least two of the three levers of power lead to communism and are, uh, and are not controlled and cannot be controlled by the proletariat. So he's saying that the things that are part of our revolution, the key elements, he says they're not controlled by workers. He says, what are the, what are the levers of revolution? He says, remember the letters of Lenin. He says the levers of revolution are economics, war, and the workers. And he says, do the workers control any of those three levers? Of course not. Therefore, communism is not controlled and cannot be controlled by the proletariat. And he's saying Marx knew this contradiction. This is a known, obvious contradiction in Marxism. 
So if the workers don't control economics and the workers don't control war and decide when war happens, and if the workers don't control the workers, who controls economics, war, and workers? I wonder who. The people they're just talking about. <laughs> it's obvious. He says those are the uh, levers of the revolution. So how are the workers going to lead the revolution but they don't control any of the levers of the revolution it's silly not to realize that and then he says well how did <clears throat> gabriel says well this is hard to believe because how how does this occur if the revolutionaries are against all of this and he says well think about the 1905 revolution uh, of uh, the russo-japanese war he said who funded japan he says it was Schiff, Kuhn, Loeb, and the American banking houses and industrialists. And by the way, that's in uh, Sutton. Sutton has a whole chapter on the Russo-Japanese War fund, and the, the West funded the, uh, the Japanese against the Tsar. And he says that was uh, because they wanted to defeat the Tsar ultimately. Now, it didn't happen right then. He said it was premature. But it was almost successful. Uh, and it did eventually lead to the 1917 revolution, which did defeat the Tsar, you see. And then he says, let me prove this to you another way. He says, how do you think that with the popularity of Lenin, he said, how did this unknown figure of Trotsky become uh, so popular? And he says that it's obvious. He married a wife, Sadova. She was associated with Zivotovsky, who was working with the Warburgs, partners and relatives of Jacob Schiff. This is the reason why Trotsky, in one move, became the most popular revolutionary on all of the, <laughs> all the revolutionary lists. Behind the back of the people who made the attempt on Archduke Ferdinand stands the people behind Trotsky. So he says that the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was by the same international clique running the British Empire, which backs up the thesis that it was a British intelligence operation, right? Because it's the, it's the people behind this. And he says that the fall of the Tsar, you see, then was a key element in the revolution. And that also is what Sutton says. Sutton says that it was... Remember that important page from Sutton uh, where we got into the Fabians? Where he mentions the British intelligence agent, Bruce Lockhart. Bruce Lockhart was the MI6 liaison to the Bolsheviks at the behest of Lord Milner. Exactly. And the Lloyd George government. And it was Lloyd George and Milner who sent Lockhart over to the uh, Bolsheviks to help out to ditch the Tsar. At that point, the British government flipped from supporting the Tsar to supporting the Bolsheviks, which led to the Tsar's destruction. The fall of the Tsar was key, he says, in order to bring in this final revolution. He says that uh, Kerensky was the real hero, not Lenin. Kerensky is the hero because he's the one that convinced them to uh, accept a republic, um, which was just a stepping stone to the Bolshevik communist government. And he says that... Um, the Japanese Russo-Japanese war was uh, financed by five member banks of the Federal Reserve in America, as well as member banks uh, in Europe. And he says that, and that's exactly what Sutton says. By the way, I don't think Sutton ever even references this uh, Rakowski thing. Let me see if he does. Wait, he does on page 36. So let's see what he said. I don't remember this. <clears throat> I 
Okay. The crux of the Stalinist accusation against the Trotskyites was that they were paid agents of international capital. Christian Rakowski was one of the uh, 1938 defendants and said, or was induced to say, we were the vanguard of foreign aggression of international capital in Spain, China, and throughout the world. The court summons under these trials says, there is not a single man in the world who has brought so much misfortune to the people as Trotsky. He is the vilest agent ultimately of, quote, fascism. Well, that just means of banking fascism. So, Kerensky is who would surrender Russia ultimately to full communism, and he does it. And so he is the real hero of the revolution, he says. But ultimately, it wasn't the revolutionaries that took power, it was the Western elite that gave Russia to the revolutionaries for their purposes. All right, so that's the first half of the Rakovsky, Rakovsky interrogation by uh, the NKVD agent. Gabriel, what would you guys think of that? Um, seems plausible. It doesn't seem... Um, it could be a thing like uh, the Iron Mountain Report, which is interesting because the Iron Mountain Report itself is supposed to be satire. However, the report from Iron Mountain literally is based on two things that are, are, are a thing that was real that's mentioned by two of the global elite texts that we've covered. So no, the report from Iron Mountain itself isn't real, but what's in it is basically real because uh, Miles Copeland mentions something very akin to it. And Alex Abea mentions uh, something very akin to it, which is the basis for the report from Iron Mountain. So if you don't know about this, it's a book that was published in 1967. Um, and it is a, it's supposed to be about a secret um, corporate government meeting that occurred as a think tank about how to bring about basically the uh, a global government government right and so it's true that the book itself is quote satire but it was written as satire to explain and expose what was an actual international corporate plan and so uh, uh miles copeland's book references it and says that well it's basically just describing what happens in the cia uh games center or the, the war game center he says that at the beginning of the book and then uh, Alex Abea mentions an actual meeting, which is basically the same thing as the report from Iron Mountain. But and he mentions like a bunch of corporate heads that that were there discussing how to create and using the Rand Corporation to create a world government. So, so we we could class the uh, Rakowski interrogation as something like the report from Iron Mountain, uh, if it is inauthentic, because it might be in it might be inauthentic but describes the real structure and history of this that uh sutton quigley uh and ratu talk about uh it's also in sutton's book america's secret establishment too which we, have, we haven't done that yet but maybe we'll do that one next because we're we've worked our way through quite a bit of sutton's text so that's the first half of the uh, Rakowski interrogation. In the second half, we will get into more uh, obscure ideas of, well, how were the, the Masons used? Because there's some nuance here in terms of the fact that a lot of the Bolsheviks were part of Masonic lodges. However, Stalin and many of the Stalin NKVD people were not very friendly to Masonry. And Yes, I've seen the picture of Stalin with his hand in his breast. but And that doesn't make him a good guy. Because, because what happens is that if this is true, and if Stalin started to... One of the reasons that he might not have taken the Marshall Plan aid, right? Which is what kicks off the Cold War. Is because he might have started to realize, hey, some of these things are used as Western intelligence 
networks, especially Masonic lodges. And Stalin also changed his view on his relationship to Jews, if you didn't know that, right? At first, Stalin wanted to court the favor of Jews, and then he decided against the... I think he uh, at first was pro-establishment of the state of Israel, and then he changed his mind. And this made a lot of Jews mad at Stalin, and Stalin mad at a lot of Jews. So that also partly explains the history of the confusion around the relationship between Stalinism and Judaism, which is eventually one of opposition. And by the time of the establishment of the state of Israel, Israel swings towards favoring the Anglo-American establishment because British intelligence, British empire basically is who sets up Israel, right? So, but Stalin was trying to court Israel as well because it would have been, I guess, a powerful ally and outpost had he succeeded in making them an ally, but he didn't. And so this is also a big part of the Cold War. And if you don't know about that, I'm not, this is actual history. You can read, uh, Mark has actually quite a few articles at es Espionage History Archive that cover this. So it's more complex than uh, an all or nothing situation. So it's in this article right here about the Cambridge Five network. That helps explain the nuance of that relationship with Stalin to the West. And so according to the Rakovsky analysis, Stalin and, and Tiny Mustache Man were both aided by the West. We just saw that in Quigley. But they also didn't do exactly everything they were supposed to do. And particularly uh, Stalin not taking the Marshall Plan aid, that begins the Cold War. So we're going to see uh, from Rakovsky's analysis the his nuanced take on the usage of Masonic lodges, which is interesting. And then we will see what he explains the ultimate purpose of the revolution is, is um, why the uh, Western elite wanted to use Tiny Mustache Man and Stalin. So they're trying to use both of these figures to engineer global crises, is what Rakowski says. So we'll look at more of that. And you can see why, you know, if this is true, then we, you can see why Stalin would have had Rakowski put to death. And if it's false, you could see why Stalin would have wanted this leaked because it, a it aids the, uh, the notion that there is a conspiracy against Stalin, right? But even if it's false, like, why does it match up perfectly with what Quigley and Sutton say in, in their books, which are not conspiracy books, right? If you would hit like and share, uh, you can support the show by its uh, Streamlabs Super Chat function. And hopefully you enjoy getting into these uh, deep historical texts as much as I do. And let's look at, let's see what's next. Um, we've already gone for a good while, so I'm going to save a lot. I'm going to save a lot of that text stuff for next time. Uh, this is good enough for tonight, I think. Uh, we got some super chats here. If you want to support the show, you can. By the way, reminder, guys, tomorrow night is the new season of Philosophy. Philosophy 101 kicks off tomorrow night for those of you who have uh, ordered the tutoring option. So the way it works is that you get access to the course, either, either option, the cheaper option or the tutoring option. But if you chose the tutoring option, tomorrow night, and you don't have to be there live, but if you want access to me, it will be every Thursday, tomorrow night at uh, 8 Central, I think is what we put. So there's your last chance tonight to sign up for philosophy course. Tutoring will be tomorrow night as long as you guys want, within reason. So what that means is you watch the first course. The first course is uh, introduction and about two hours on the pre-Socratics. 
So you watch the first course on pre-Socratics and then you decide if you, you know, write down your questions, what's confusing to you, if you chose the tutoring option. You can also upgrade the tutoring option too if you want to. I think Josh uh, sent out the link for that today. So tonight is we cover Copleston's volume one. Not the whole book, but the sections on the pre-Socratics. So basically this is like... Mm, The first, roughly the first 80 or 90 pages, because you don't have to get it like the first 86 pages because it gets into sophus. You don't really have to do the sophus if you, if you don't want to, because they're all kind of just, they're just basically relativists. But, you know, if you want to uh, go ahead, read ahead, you can read up into the sophus. But so it's basically the first 75 pages up to the atomus in uh Copleston's volume one kind of a classic for the for the history of western philosophy and uh you know the, I think it was one of the best one of the best of all the courses actually I mean they're all good but I think the uh, pre-socratics one is really good because you'll realize when you when you do the pre-socratic course that oh, so basically all the rest of philosophy is just kind of debating the things that the pre-socratics brought up right so like identity over time the explanation of change right i mean all of those things are what hegel's dealing with right so essentially philosophy is just guys trying to solve the problems of the guy before them and it doesn't devolve a whole lot from from the time of the pre-Socratics, and, and this is where dialectics comes out of, right? So if we want to understand Marxist dialectics, then you got to understand the pre-Socratics. Because in fact, I think I think it's Lenin has an essay where he says that, you know, I'm just basically restating uh, Heraclitus that all is flux. And that's, that is the philosophy of the revolution. There is no truth or fixity. Everything is in constant upheaval and revolution. And that is the true spirit of the revolution. In fact, we did an analysis of one of the Frankfurt School guys, Jürgen Habermas, Theory and Praxis, because I read this and analyzed it five or six years ago. And we got, and, and he talks about Gnosticism, and, and I think Habermas is somebody who really understands what the revolution is. And he, he's, he's saying that the revolution is never ending. And you could say, okay, that's, tr quote, true Marxism, right? Habermas wrote uh, Theory and Practice in 1973. And if you didn't notice, if you go to my community tab, I linked my analysis of Theory and Praxis from five years ago. It's on the community tab. So th that's an important text. <clears throat> and, and, and that's another thing that makes me think that what Rakowski is saying is true because... I mean, you have to like go pretty deep into Marxism to see those kinds of things, right? That the revolution is never ending. It's, it's always, it's, it's a perpetual revolution. It's a revolution against the revolutionaries. Um, yeah, so you can, of course, purchase the philosophy course at any time. And you do not have to purchase the uh, tutoring option if you don't want it. There's the do-it-yourself option, which is just the courses. And you do get access to everybody else's Q&A in those courses as well for the first the season that we did a few months ago. Um, this time around, you will be expected tomorrow night to have watched part one, lecture one. So if you come tomorrow night and you haven't watched lecture one, you're going to be lost. So... If you've not watched it between now and tomorrow night, you watch lecture one introduction in the pre-Socratics and then we get into it. I show up and we, we chat and we go through all your questions as long as you want now within reason. Okay. So don't, if I don't stay for four hours, don't bitch and complain. I paid money and you didn't answer my questions for seven hours straight. Yeah. I didn't commit to seven hours straight. You don't own me. But I will try to stay as long as I can, unless I get too too tired.
All right, so that's tomorrow night. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, we're trying to now arrange the California event. That's going to be great. And I'm really working on getting you know who to speak. I don't want to say that he can speak because he hasn't totally confirmed. He said he wants to, but we're just trying to figure out the date to make it work. Uh, and so this is, this is, it'll be a surprise guest. As you guys, as you guys know, we typically invite a guest speaker at our live events. And so we just did the Austin, Texas live event. It was great. We had over a hundred people and BG Cumby did his comedy. He was our special guest. Prior to that, uh, we had a brief uh, talk by Kotel, and we had Father Vladimir give a lengthy hour and a half presentation in the Orlando event on um, Renaissance art and geometric structure. And then in the first event in Nashville, we didn't have any special guests, I don't think. It was just me and Jamie. Uh, but it was still fun. It was a blast. Um, but we'll have another special guest, hopefully, if we can make it work. At least he wants to do it. For the California event, bro. Hopefully, uh, we can engineer a multiple podcast thing. So maybe we can try to meet up with you know Sam Tripoli, do that podcast. Try to do some other podcasts in, in California. It'll be a lot of fun. I think it's gonna work. So uh, I'll I'll put it this way: it's a funny man. It's a funny man. California, 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 dreaming with a funny man, with a funny man. Uh, where are we at? Yeah, tonight was a little more serious of what we weren't joking around tonight because I had to get through this material. If I just joke around, you know, it's just people can't handle it. People can't handle it. You got to you gotta have this mix. You know, you got to have it all. Got to do it all nowadays. Joshy sends $10 and says nothing. Thank you, Joshy. BMX 1966, long time super chatter. Thank you so much. Says great stuff. Thank you. <clears throat> we did a reserved analysis. Uh, we don't know for sure if this is a, a legitimate document, but it's a interesting piece of Cold War Arcana that most people don't talk about. And it does fit within the information from Sutton and Quigley that we do talk about. So Dandolph Dyer, that's a nice name. $10. I hope they find a cure for your condition soon. We're praying for your prayed up. Thank you. If you didn't watch my Dandolph skit, somebody says, I like your skit writing. Guess what? That was all improv. I'm not joking. None of that was planned. I just turned on the camera and the character came out. That's also, by the way, why the character seems to change his voice because the character himself underwent a kind of character evolution in the midst of the skit. But hey, that's the kind of weirdness that we love around these parts. So you can go watch my skit, my dandruff skit here. We love it wacky. We love it silly. And we love it improv. So it just, it just spilled out that way. So. Next up is Ortho Zephos, Ortho Orthodo Zephos to five dollars. God bless, brother. Do you ha ever hear of the end times theory with the elites? I don't know if it's academic or just crazy. Nimrod's tomb found in the cloning of Nimrod. Uh, I would say that that is uh, crazy. No offense to you, but no, I don't believe in cloning from Nimrod's tomb. J Mel forty dollars. This is jaw dropping information. It is an outside source for Quigley and Sutton. Yes. Yeah, so at the introduction of the book, it talks about how it's the only piece of information from within the Soviet Union during the Soviet period at that time. When, when was this printed? I don't know. A long time ago. Um, right. 1970s, basically. Right, so Sutton and Quigley, right, their analysis is outside of the Soviet Union. And so this is the one unique piece of information from within the Soviet Union that kind of backs up the Quigley-Sutton thesis, exactly. J-Mel again for $10. Where do elites intend to continue esoteric Marxist revolution once they ended the USSR? Where did Marxism go? 
Yeah, I see. I see. I think Marxism, just like so, monopoly capital, Marxism, socialism, um, capitalism, democracy. Those are just systems that can be used to see which one works the best. So they'll they'll use different systems in different areas to to run and to control things, and so they don't really need Marxism per se. Because what Rakovsky is saying is that Marxism is a tool for the same people that used fascism or monopoly capital as a tool. Those are tools. And the end goal was always what uh, Huxley talks about in Brave New World, the final revolution. So if you remember Brave New World, which we just covered with Frank, by the way. So if you don't subscribe to my Rockfin or to my website, I would suggest doing it. The link is in the show description, by the way. Um, over on my Rockfin, by the way, there's a ton of free stuff on Rockfin. It's a great free speech-based platform. I can say a lot more over there that I can say here. Stuff that, that's a little too spicy for for this uh, platform. There's my Rockfin channel, and you can go over to Rockfin, and we... Just I just posted the uh, the hour with Frank and I on right here. Brave New World chapters one to three. So this is separate from the course. This is just me and Frank, but it's just for subscri- his subscribers and my subscribers, paid subscribers, uh, where we do the first. We did uh, the first three chapters of Brave New World. So if you're asking, it goes to here. So the end goal of Marxism isn't a Marxist dictator. The end goal of Marxism is the withering away of the state, or uh, that's the public doctrine of the end of the end goal of Marxism, or the now end of humanity. That's the end goal. Because... It's kind of like what Father Seraphim Rose says in his book, Nihilism, Roots of the Revolution. The end goal of the revolution is nihilism because the motivation of the revolution is demonic. Where did Marxism go after 1989? I think Marxism served its course. And so after 1989, you essentially have um, what... What one isn't really communism, it isn't really capitalism, it's Fabianism. So there's your answer. So go watch the uh, Milner Fabian lectures that we've done because Fabianism is reformed Marxism that is allied with monopoly capital, which is actually what Rakovsky was saying the whole time. So Fabian socialism is, is capitalist socialism. That's what this means. So that's where it went. Its goal was always the synthesis. The dialectical opposites of communism and socialism or communism, they blend into the synthesis, which is capitalist socialism. Riley, $10. I became a catechumen in the OCA. Your videos played a significant role uh, in me leaving atheism. Thank you for your work and God bless you accordingly. Hey, great to hear that. Hopefully you have a good OCA church and not one of the OCA that tries to tell people not to listen to me. Mark A, $5. This is intriguing stuff. Yeah, thank you. I mean, if you're not familiar with this material, then you would need to go into the um, more foundational material that we've covered, right? Which would be uh, Anglo-American Establishment by Quigley, Wall Street Bolshevik Revolution by Sutton, and my Tragedy and Hope Lectures. By the way, my plan with what we're going to do over on Autonomy University is I'm, I want to have eventually basically like a whole series of courses. So I want a whole series of courses on geopolitics, namely the Global Elite book series. I want a whole course on espionage. Uh, Richard was saying, do another philosophy course, maybe. I don't know exactly what we would do a whole course. I, mean, I just have to think about it. Um a course on great lit. Like what if we had, you know, a lit course of brave new world and 1984 and Dostoevsky. I mean, that would be pretty badass too. Right. Cause I have a degree in lit as well. So, um, 
Hell, we could do a whole course on Marxism. I mean, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert in Marxism, but I would say that I know enough to like teach and explain basically, you know, Marxist theory and kind of the history and the different schisms of Marxism. I mean, I'd have to brush up on a lot of stuff, but I mean, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm envisioning is a whole series of courses at Autonomy University. Um, and you know, it's great to work with Richard shout out to Richard, head on over to Tragic Hope, uh, or Grand Theft World on Rockton. Grand Theft World has its own channel too. Um, I think in the show description, there's the, um, you can sign up for the other courses, by the way, I'm not the only person that has a course. There's a whole bunch of people that have courses over there. There is the link for the autonomy university, but, but ideally I want to have like a whole, you know, bevy of courses over there as well. And I would say after, you know, after philosophy 101, I would probably do the, uh, a course on the global elite books. And I mean, we'd probably pick, I don't know how we would do that. It would need to be more than 12 courses. I mean, we need to pick like the top 20 writings of the elite and do just an entire course working through each of those books. Um, I could also teach a course uh, on Orthodox theology. I think, I think I could do that too. Um, I mean, I know that well enough to teach a course, but, uh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see where we want to go with all that. Um, but anyway, if you don't subscribe over on Rockfin, be sure and do that. There's the course or there's the class that Frank and I are doing on, uh, Brave New World. So I'll link that for you right here. But remember, not everything on Rockfin is paid. There's a lot of free stuff on Rockfin too. You can also sub, uh, support me on Super Chats via Super Chats on Rockfin too. Andrew, $5. This is amazing. This explains a lot. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, if if it's valid in terms of like, if it's an authentic document, yeah, then it does really mesh 100% with uh, Sutton and Quigley. By the way, there's there's other books that I've only recently gotten. Like, I didn't know about this Charles Hyam book. I'd heard of this book, but I never bought it until the other day. So, uh, I just bought Aiding the Enemy, Enemy by Charles Hyam, which is uh, the same type of material. Storm the Cat. I read that Trotsky supported the Skittles feminist. Yeah, see, this is another thing that uh, Trotsky... When Stalin takes over, Stalin is at least in, according to the public statement of the party is not pro Skittles. This is why it's really annoying when all of the people who talk about Marxism all day long, I'm not naming anybody in particular. I'm talking about like neocon, these type of like cold warrior people. And they think that like that all of the Skittle stuff is Marxist and KGB people. And it's like, it's the fortune 100. It's not KGB people. Who, who do you, th I mean, how out of touch are you? Let's see. Party platform. By the way, I'm not, st I'm not pro Stalin. I don't have any interest and in, I don't care about Stalin. Because anytime I talk about this, people are like, you Stalin. You KGB. I'm trying to find the party platform here uh, under Stalin because it'll tell you that he was anti Skittles. They weren't pro Skittles. But it's hard to find. Does anybody have a link to the. I used to. I used to have it saved. I can't find it, but anyway, under Stalin, the party was not pro Skittles. So I would say that, yeah, the, the Bolsheviks were, that doesn't make Stalin a good guy. It just means he wasn't pro Skittles. Okay. Um, 
But the Bolsheviks were pretty wild, dude. They were like doing some, you know, satanic orgy stuff. I mean, they were doing some crazy stuff. Gleb Boki. Remember him? Have you heard of him? Uh, Bolshevik occultism. Yes, Gleb Boki. Who is this? What channel is this? My name is Jim Nichols. I'm a former advisor to the CIA. I don't know who that is. And sure enough, if I link him, he'll be some lunatic. I don't, but I don't know who it is. Anyway, Mark, uh, Mark Hackard has a, a essay on Gle- Gleb Bokei. That's what I, that's what I'm looking for. And he was into like, yeah, uh, eyes wide shut party stuff. This guy. So check out Mark's excellent article on this. Oops. Yeah, so the answer is some of them, yes, were pretty uh, degen in terms of like the uh, early era Bolsheviks. But Stalin saw that these policies were destructive and felt like they might ultimately destroy his regime. So that's why Stalin, I'm not, and it doesn't even make Stalin a hero. It just means that he saw that the policies were not good. <laughs> like they did, like all of this degeneracy is not good for the Soviet Union to survive. So that's, that's the motivation. You could just say it's totally, it's not because Stalin is some virtuous saintly hero person. It's just, he saw that they were destructive policies. Sonia Kotlika, $10. Thank you so much. Jesse Saras is $10. By the way, This analysis also is in line with, uh, what's his name? Kerry Bolton. And I'm not advocating everything Kerry Bolton says. But he came to this conclusion too about Stalin. And he mentions it from Quigley. Yeah, so this is uh, also worth a read. Kerry Bolton's essay, Origins of the Cold War, how Stalin foiled a new world order. Now, it does not mean that Stalin is a hero. It just means that, as Rakovsky said, he was not doing what the funders of the revolution wanted. And again, if you fall into the dumb dialectic, thinking that I'm a bad guy because I said that or I'm saying that Stalin's a hero I'm just going to immediately block you because I'm not saying that. It doesn't matter how many times I say that I'm not saying that. They just say, no, you are saying that. You are saying that. I mean, I'm sitting here telling you that the Bolsheviks are degenerates. And I'm saying that the motivation for Stalin was, I'm sure, purely pragmatic. Had nothing to do with justice or you know oh Stalin was secretly some saint I don't believe that I believe it's just rival mobs but I think Stalin might have been perceptive enough to be like hey I don't want to be used by uh, you know western powers and duped by western powers right and he probably saw that oh actually these Bolshevik policies of everybody being degenerates it destroys the society so if you're a power hungry person who wants to have a society to be power hungry over it's probably not going to work too well to completely destroy your society um adam 1912 ten dollars thank you so much sonia again five dollars thank you so much somebody got mad by the way when I scroll to the super chat, sometimes I scroll past some because there's a really small window of where you see the, the recent super chats. So if you scroll a little bit, it goes past a bunch of them. And so if you just assume that I'm intentionally not reading your super chat, I will. And you call me a thief as some people do. Some guy did the other day. We'll just never talk again. Uh, element to David. So $5. Thank you for, insights on this text do you keep entertainment history do you keep to entertainment history 
do you keep to entertainment or would you be getting more involved in current geopolitics? Uh, I don't know what that means. Do you mean, am I not going to cover movies and just talk about this stuff? No, we've always on my channel rotated through multiple things because I find multiple things interesting. I like to talk about multiple things. So sometimes I go through phases where I'm more interested in talking about geopolitical stuff because I'm reading geopolitical books. Maybe I go through a phase where I'm reading spy books and I'm talking about that all the time, watching spy movies. Maybe I'm watching stupid esoteric movies and decoding them. Maybe I'm watching B movies and making fun of them. Maybe we're, I don't know, reading a philosophical. I mean, we just do different stuff. So now I'm not uh, choosing one thing. What about Heartland War and major players involved? Um, you mean talking about the Ukraine situation? Well, I think we're kind of limited in terms of YouTube and far in terms of what we could talk about. But I mean, I've probably done, I've done multiple hours uh, on the Ukraine situation with multiple people, including Colonel McGregor. I mean, I don't know how many times I can, you know, cover the issue, but not being a douchebag, you're just saying JPEG ten dollars. Thank you for the murky waters of history, especially the recent recent covert means in terms of Christianity and Hollywood. It'd be nice to learn about the Tavistock Beatles material. Uh, I've done podcasts on that. I mean, I don't have any set hard opinion on whether the Beatles were a Tavistock creation. I do know what John Coleman says. I think that it's possible that the Beatles were definitely um, used by British intelligence and Tavistock Institute to inculcate different things, including the promotion of the New Age movement, that kind of stuff. Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi, sure. I think I think there's truth to all that. I don't I don't know that I'm I buy that they're like a creation of Tavistock. I mean, maybe. Or that they're a Frankfurt school. I don't know. Maybe. But, um, you know, I think John Coleman on the whole was correct. And Jamie just read Conspirators Hierarchy. Committee of 300. Uh, I'll probably do Committee of 300 too eventually. I just haven't got to it yet. Um, but, you know, any of these analyses, even if it's like one of the most, you know, they're not going to get everything correct. Right. So I might agree with 90% of what John Coleman says. And then, you know, it turns out that 10% of his analysis wasn't correct because maybe the elites, when he was uh, at writing about them in the eighties or whatever, maybe they didn't get everything they wanted. So maybe not every projection is correct or every fact is correct per se. But I think overall that book's pretty accurate. Uh, also, guys, remember that the uh, show sponsor is Chalk.com. That is the best supplements that you can find. Look at all these stacks of books everywhere. But look, what you can't forget is the Chalk.com. What about that testosterone-boosting Tonkat Ali? That's my favorite. I love the Tonkat Ali. Jamie's a big fan of the Sheila Jet. She takes it all the time. It's great for mental focus and clarity. I saw people in the comments the other day saying, hey, I've been really enjoying Sheila Jet." It really does give focus when it comes to, you know, studying, research, doing schoolwork, that kind of, it's great for that. Ladies, if you have like hormone imbalance or whatever, Jamie tested out the Irish Moss. She took that for several weeks. She said it helped her out. Um, none of the, of the chalk products that we've tried have been bad. I mean, they've all basically done what they're supposed to do and they've done it well. And so I want to encourage you to head on over to chalk.com, that's choq.com. And use the promo code J50 to get 50% off all those products. Literally everything over there, you can get 50% off. And uh, they have the uh, superfoods, right? You can get the chocolate, which is a great superfood additive for smoothies, whatever your smoothie regimen is. And the reason that chalk's so good, and they also have products that are overall fits, right? Like Seven Wonders, which covers um, seven different uh, nutrients that we don't get. So basically the diets, the food, everything in the West, especially is nutrient deficient. And so chalk is there to provide the nutrient uh, supplements to make up for those deficiencies so that we don't fall into lethargy and soy masculinity or soy anti-masculinity. And we up our toxic masculinity points, right? I mean, look, if I make a soy face, look, and I touch the chalk, it goes away. Watch. See, 
you visibly see soy face flee my body like kryptonite when chalk is in the room if i if i touch the chalk bottle i, I physically lose my soy face and you will too head on over to chalk.com by the way chalk has a great series of stacks that you can uh pick out for guys and for girls right so you're a dude you want i don't know what to get there's a male stack already set up for you boom hit that stack right if you're a lady boom there's a stack for the ladies over there and you can also use the promo code j53life it's a little more of a discount because j53life will give you 53 percent off all the products that you put into a recurring subscription so chalk has, I mean, again, we're like, you know, big time united to chalk.com. We love them. They're a great, awesome, uh, Bayes red pill company. And so best way to support me is to also support them. So use the promo code J 53 life to get the recurring subscriptions of chalk. And, uh, I guarantee you won't be disappointed element to Davis toe $5 shout out to chalk. See right there. People in the chats shouting out to chalk. You can't beat that. And so I will, yeah, shout out to Chalk. You saw, you guys saw the way literally my soy face just disappears merely by touching a bottle of Tonkat Lee. Can't beat that. Guys, if you would hit like and share, hopefully we had a, a good, insightful, educational Cold War theorizing analysis tonight. Maybe tomorrow we'll be back with more of the uh, chat GBT AI tech stuff. I didn't get to the stuff I really wanted. Some of the other things I wanted to get to, like, let's see, what else did we want to get to? We're, tomorrow night, maybe, if we're not busy, we'll do CIA fake news. Interesting. Fake news. This is a uh, clip from an old documentary about the CIA. We will look at uh, Lord Birkenhead's predictions in his famous 1930-ish, 1930 or 2020s essay. Remember that? We've talked about it. Shout out to Tristan because Tristan is who hipped us to Royal Society elitist uh, Lord Birkenhead and his predictions before Brave New World. So basically, Lord Birkenhead talks about what was in Brave New World before Brave New World. We'll look at those predictions. We'll look at more CIA operations that now Tulsi Gabbard is out here tweeting about CIA ops. We'll look at uh, some WikiLeaks tweets. We will look at the, uh, what is this? Patrick Henningsen has a tweet about an uh, interview with Philip Agee. I have his book, by the way. Um, so we might do that one in the future. If we do the if we do the espionage course, we'll cover a lot of those books. Um, Philip Agee, Cloak and Gown, Robin uh, Wink or whatever. Uh, we'll get to the Irregulars. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll do all those as well as, you know, the, some of the Quigley texts, I'm sure. If we do an espionage course uh, tomorrow night, as you guys know, we'll play this Richard clip. See what Richard says about the philosophy course here. I don't know why when you you pause a Twitter page for a bit, it just does not play. So let's go back to let's see what Richard says. I want to show off something that we're all proud of. I got a browser here. This is uh, Jay Dyer's much vaunted, much sought after philosophy 101. Now, he just got this page up. We are just testing it out. You guys are some of the first people in the world to see it. I want to say, for my part, it's not philosophy 101. I think this is a mis mistitling. I really think is as, as like philosophy unleashed. Because a philosophy 101 course, they give you kind of some useless information that you can't make sense of. Jay actually lays out over 12 weeks, dozens and dozens of hours put into just the presentation of this, let alone the hundreds and thousands of hours of research that it takes to have a coherent evolution in history of the origins of philosophy, the uses of philosophy, the different ways to look at it over time, and how that has uh, been brought about to what we have today, which is almost an absence of philosophy on the objective logic and reason side and an overabundance of woke philosophy that is irrational is made up day by day as people are like, I think we should bring racism back. And then here's a justification. And then it gets wokeified and, and spread out. And then all of a sudden you have a bunch of communist socialist ideas where you become the property in action. 
you need to be able to stand your own ground. It helps to have a foundation in philosophy because it's a method to find truth. When you get down to it, philosophy is there because you love truth enough to go and learn how to find it because it's valuable. So if you're interested in things like that, there is uh, the landing page. We'll link it up in the notes. It is uh, a longer one, so we'll get a shorter uh, URL for this. I'm sure Jay has a link on his page. I just wanted to show it off. Now you know it exists. You can go look for it and see why this is not your father's philosophy, right? So uh, well done. Shout out to Richard. Yeah, thank you for that uh, kind words there from Richard. Um, hope you guys enjoy the class. Again, tomorrow night is uh, tutoring after you've watched the course. Tutoring begins at 8 p.m. tomorrow night, Central Standard Time, for those that purchase tutoring. Um, I forgot this. Yeah, see, I, I missed a super chat. See, really, people think it's some sort of conspiracy that I'm not I'm not reading super chats. I just scroll past them. Andrew, for $5, why is Foucault important? Well, Foucault, um, he's important, I guess, be, for multiple reasons. I mean, you could say he's important because he was propped up by people who wanted to make him important. Uh, the postmodernists and deconstructionists and all those guys actually were uh, aided and propped up by the CIA. And we've covered that. That's that's well known. Um, Derrida, all those people had uh, intentional public uh, CIA support as, for whatever reason, part of the Cold War. I think the CIA was experimenting and trying to co-opt and use a lot of ideas uh, you know, for different things. And they saw the possibility of postmodern ab abstract art, all that stuff uh, as a kind of um, technique for winning the, the cult, the ideological war against uh, Soviet cosmism, realism, etc. Um, so that's part of why uh, Foucault is important. Um, you say he was also a degenerate. So, I mean, if you're a degenerate, you're going to be propped up pretty much 100 percent um what about critical theory how does it well critical theory is part of the marxist tradition because marxist critical theory is what we read about in the frankfurt school guys right so that's horkheimer adorno habermas all those guys and they seem to be consistent with the classical marxist approach which is to critique the critique so critique is not just ideological critique is negating existing institutions so what that means is you're always working to revolutionize and what did Rakovsky say the revolution is the religion the revolution is the end the revolution is not getting you to somewhere the meaning is the 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 journey is the destination the revolution is the destination and so revolution is the tearing down of all structures that's the true revolutionary. So postmodern deconstructionism is just another facet, another uh, weapon in the arsenal of revolution, even though postmodernists are not tip technically speaking Marxists. Marxists, I mean, postmodernists typically would probably uh, reject classical Marxism in the sense of like attaining... Uh, uh, libertarian utopia with a no state like Marx said but there would also there are also some Marxists who are also postmodernists and into critical theory so you can get overlap of all kinds of weirdos in academic a academia but um, it's why is it pushed because it contributes to the revolution that's why and the revolution is not ultimately Marxist it's this it's post it's post human it's the final revolution I mean one of the things that we highlighted in the uh, discussion with Frank is that did you did you realize that the people in Brave New World are named after both monopoly capitalists and Marxists? There's Lenina, the female of Lenin, female version of Lenin. There's Bernard Marx, key character, and then they always talk about the year of our Ford, Henry Ford. So. Huxley understood as I think one of the inner party initiates that communism and Marxism are not actual enemy enemies. They are co-participants in the dialectic. 